Hello, everyone. My name is Alafia Stewart, Learning Director of the Mountain Foundation, and I am so overjoyed to have uh, one of our founders with us, Bill Melton, and we are going to do what I am just over the moon about. This is a very special Melton Day presentation because it is also in commemoration of Bill's 80th birthday. And so without further ado, um, Bill, how are you? <laughs> Wonderful. Glad to be here. Glad to see you. Great, great. Um, so I think that it might be, you know, I think the mountain community is going to be really excited about our topics today and some of the questions, learning more about you, learning more about your thoughts, feelings, philosophies, and, and more about the foundation in general and, you know, all the things that had happened before we became what we are. <laughs> so... I guess my first question would be, what are your thoughts about turning 80 this year? Well, uh, I guess I'm a little bit surprised to have made it this far. Uh, a little bit surprised that uh, I don't feel older than I do. Uh, I would always appreciate uh, perhaps being um, a few 10 years younger, but uh, who knows, uh, maybe we can make it another 10 or 15 years down the road. I'm still learning every day. Um, I'm still actively engaged in life every day. And I'm still uh, involved with entrepreneurial efforts every day. And um, my some of my biggest regrets is that uh, I don't have uh, more hours in the day. And um, I can only learn as fast as I'm learning. So those are not too bad to cope with. They're not, and that's amazing. I'm rooting for at least a hundred years. Who knows? <laughs> okay. But I'll be rooting for a hundred years or more. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, then my next question to you is a little on the silly side, but what are the most rewarding things about getting older? Is it the lifetime of knowledge? Is it the senior discount at the movie theater? <laughs> <laughs> Well, given COVID, I haven't been able to use those recently. Um, that, that is an interesting question. Um, I think there is a quiet appreciation of the accumulated um, accumulated experiences. Uh, there, there's, you know, a, a library of accumulated experiences that you can open to almost any page that is probably relevant to some experience that I or a friend is, is having today. So, so that's nice. It, there's a richness there that uh, certainly as a young person, as a young person, as whatever a young person is, um, and 50 years old is, is young in my life these days, but as a young person, you sort of have this urgency that this is, this is it. This is the first time this has ever happened and it's the last time this is ever going to... So there's sort of a panic about things. But after you accumulate enough experiences, you say, well, yeah, this has happened before. And yes, it probably is urgent, but you know, it probably is not the end of the world either one way or the other. So it's easier to take yourself with less frenetic seriousness than, than I did when I was younger. And so that's nice. And then just the bodily processes, that is the urges of youth, the uh, hormones going through your body as a young person are so urgent that everything is driven uh, in that way. And when you get older, it's more of a life of the mind and less of a life of the body. And I think that is probably the evolutionary path that we as humanity are on is to learn that we are primarily and deeply and almost spiritually we are we are entities of mind and we are not biological meat suits and when it's younger it's harder to make that distinction than when you're older i can imagine and i'm just i'm thinking about i'm so i'm turning 35 this year and i think back to when i was 15. yeah and it's, it's the same thing, the same thing. Everything felt so urgent. Yeah. It was the end of the world. <laughs> right. And I, I'm, I'm glad to be out of that. <laughs> yeah. All right, Bill, for my next question, what are the most important lessons you've learned in your life and the stories behind those lessons? So I think the lesson I have learned and relearned and had to relearn is to give permission and respect um, and honor to whatever your internal teacher is. Inside of us, we all have an internal teacher. And that's ultimately the only true one. We grow up in communities and families and cultures that try to 
put us in various kinds of boxes and so that we will look good in those boxes and that we'll be able to perform inside our communities and our cultures and there's a certain amount of that that we do have to learn we have to take care of as i say the meat suits that uh, we're responsible for taking care of and for that you need a certain amount of skills and with a certain amount of compliance with the rules of the family the community the culture that we're in but that's a secondary and i would say tertiary and far down the road fourth or fifth or sixth teacher the first one is to always to start by giving yourself respect people say follow your passion and other people say well what's my passion well if you don't give yourself respect first of all you won't be able to find your passion because you will have been so beaten down in rejecting whatever those passions are. So first of all, you start with your respect and you give yourself permission, you give yourself passion. And if you do all of that, then you'll have the energy and the interest to learn what you need to learn to to complete whatever whatever direction that passion takes you. You won't stop learning. I mean, and, you know, I I sit here and I learn 8 hours a day if not 12 hours a day because I'm still learning, but it's it's what I want. It's what I want to do, what I want to learn about. And nobody tells me I have to do it. And and as kids go to school whether they're second grade or in college, it shouldn't be because they have to. It's because they're passionately interested in it for whatever is the internal the internal teacher inside themselves. And so the first and important lesson is to respect that internal teacher. And when life says that internal teacher is being crushed for whatever reason, be aware and if you need to make life changes make life changes i mean life changes are not easy they're painful they're sometimes calamitous financially uh sometimes they're physically dangerous but those are choices we make so you know as a kid i grew up in the american midwest where they wanted me to be a right wing fundamentalist preacher and work on a farm i said no thank you <laughs> And oh really? Really. Wow. <laughs> and you are definitely not that. <laughs> But it, it it's the ability to say no, I'm going to go my own path. That path has led me literally around the world um uh, many many times and it's led me to meeting all the wonderful people that are in the foundation and the creation of the foundation. And it's led me to a, a life of most of the time uh, happiness. uh a lot of times uh, sheer panic uh <laughs> frequently confusion um but i i wouldn't trade any of it and i you know now more than ever uh not only in myself but in others that i talk to on a daily basis i say what what's the internal teacher what what does your heart say and uh, figure out how to do it i say well, i don't know how to do it well that's that's the challenge that's that's what we individually and collectively have to do it and we have to do it without without coercion of others and i think quite probably that is a place that we're at in human history now is that we until now have done most things culturally and socially uh through various forms of coercion and we have to let that go thank you so my next question is who or what has influenced you the most very simply i think um we are influenced by our, our birth families and our birth cultures and we either learn from them or rebel against them i think i have done a lot of that and certainly our cultures are such powerful influences in our lives and the reason they're so powerful is that most of what they do is on a subconscious uh, subconscious level we are as the old buddhist uh, or zen Uh, analogy is we are truly fish in water without realizing we are in the water without even knowing what water is and that's what our cultures are our cultures are the water that in is surrounds us all the time and the challenge is how do how did i how do i climb out of the cultural influences that are on me every day and all we have to do now is to read the newspapers and what's going on in the world and it's easy for us to get all partisan as to who we're for or who we're against that's being the water that that we're not aware of and so how do i escape from that water and certainly as a young person i went to asia and i lived as in many ways 
in the Asian language, in Chinese in this particular case, the Asian food, uh, married Asian uh, people, married Asian wife. And I lived in that culture. And that allowed me to escape the water that I was raised in. Uh, I didn't have to ha- learn. I didn't have to hate all of it. I could still love a little bit, bit of it, but I didn't. I could look at it from a different set of, of glasses. And that escaping uh, from our birth culture enveloping ocean that we're born into um that that effort to escape from it is at the foundation of what i was hoping to do within the the melton foundation is to let other people have similar experiences of recognizing whatever they were born into and and the good parts of that but but being able to get out out of it by wearing the eyes wearing the glasses wearing the experiences of other young people in other cultures thereby to be given freedom of all the cultures and then return to your internal metric and say okay given everything that i've experienced what is my internal metric where am i to go now all right my next question is what life advice would you pass along to the fellows First of all, I try not to tell anybody else how to live. <laughs> I, I think to a large extent, experience it cannot be taught. Um, you have to learn it yourself the hard way. Uh, sorry. <laughs> what, I, what, I, what we do and can share are visions, visions of the future, visions of what a life can be. We can share stories as sort of notes or evidence on whatever vision we're sharing. So we can share visions, my vision, your vision, all our visions. But can I tell you how to live? No, I cannot. That has to come from inside. So again, back to the same message, trust what is inside. Listen to other people's visions, listen to other people's great plans, listen to other people what they want to do. But you have to listen to what's inside. And I can't tell you and nobody can tell you. And if anybody else is trying to tell you, back up, l- look out, <laughs> that's a form of coercion. And do not accept coercion. That is, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about all this and then how it applies to my own life. And I know you didn't intend to give advice, but this is a gem, a gem of something to, to, to really digest and to think on because it just keeps circling back to the same mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. Okay. So Bill, if you could go back to any age, what would it be? Uh, Would you stay the age you are now or go back? If going back, how far and what was life like at that time? I think the design of the universe is that we are always blessed and cursed to live in the moment. Um, I certainly have fond memories of uh, earlier stages in my life. Many very fond, fond, exciting memories. And I tell stories about those fond times, but if I'm being truthful, a lot of those times were tough times too, and they were embarrassing times, and they were stupid times. They were, (laughs) if if I if I'm being fair about any time in life, it was always a mixture of brilliant stupidity, courage, cowardice. I mean, the whole thing, and. You know, is there any perfect time? No. You know, all the deep spiritual teachers try to tell you, well, there's nothing but, you know, this moment. Well, on the surface, that sounds crazy. But if we are living from our deepest part of us, whoever we are, we are projecting out onto the world uh, sort of an image of what's inside of us. You know, how, you know, that sounds a little bit crazy, but I think there's a large element of that. Certainly on individual lives, we, we create our ecosystem that we live in, our psychological, social ecosystem, largely that we live in. And so change starts with changing in ourselves internally. And so I like myself most of the time as a younger person, many times in many places, but I also am very embarrassed by myself as a young person, many times in many places. <laughs> so. <laughs> There's no escape from the present. We're always in the present. And thank you for that. I, I, <laughs> I resonate with that a lot. So it's just best to stay in the present because it is a mix of all of those things. <laughs> all right, Bill, my next question to you is, what is your first Melton Foundation memory? Do you remember what was on your mind during our official establishment as a foundation? 
Yeah, I do. Um, it, I, it, this was the, the formation part of the establish, uh, establishing the foundation. Um, th at that period in my life was very early in my relationship with Patricia. And uh, we had gone to Europe. Uh, this was uh, either in the fall of sometime in 19, late 1980, probably late 1989, and the Berlin Wall had come down. And we were driving um, through what was at that time still old East uh, East Germany. And um, it, it was not like East Germany today, or it was not like Germany today. It was pretty, pretty drab, uh, pretty dark, uh, pretty dreary, and uh, clearly um, not thriving. And as we drove and we talked, as uh, people do when they're um, in a new relationship, we were trying to visualize the world. And it was clear to us that the world was going through dramatic, dramatic changes in 1989. Uh, there's all kinds of church changes on, on a worldwide basis in that year. And we were looking at what happens when the world goes through huge transformations. And it's sort of odd that here we are, um, this many decades later, and I see the world going through transformations that probably are as great or greater than was happening in 1989 and 1990. And our vision was that as the world goes through chaos and as traditional institutions fail and fall apart, as clearly in 1989 they were in that part of the world, uh, we were saying, what happens? How does, how does the world reorganize itself? How does the world find its feet and stand up again. And the way that we hypothesized, and I still think it's probably true, is that it, it happens by long-term personal relationships. You know, if you are in some sort of an institution and the institution falls apart, who do you connect with? You know, who do you, you connect with somebody who's an extended family member, an extended college friend, uh, an extended professional, somebody who you've had long and deep relationships with that you can trust. And you turn to them and say, you know, this is my situation, what's your situation, what are we gonna do? And I think you were about potentially to experience some more of these kinds of uh, institutional failures, institutional failures on a national level, on an international level. And we will need uh, to reach out uh, to, to each other uh, to say, okay, what do we do? I mean, uh, and that that's the way forward. So as we were driving and talking uh, to say, well, where do those relationships come from? Well, they come frequently from our time that we're leaving our family setting and the time that we're not yet into a full-time professional setting. Because in a family setting, you're controlled by your family. In your full-time professional setting, you're probably going to be controlled by your uh, career boundaries, whatever that is. But in your college setting, in your young adulthood college setting, you're somewhat free. You're free to establish new connections. And if you have a natural passion, a natural set of interests, a natural set of uh, personal characteristics that attract you to someone else, this is probably where you're going to start to explore and form those relationships. So, okay, if that is a time of relatively free formation, free connection, then shouldn't we think together, and I was thinking together with Patricia, think together, how would we create a situation where people could, without the historical constraints of geography or without the historical constraints of a particular culture, without the constraints of a particular economy, how could you open up the opportunity of finding deep connections and deep relationships, which then 10, 20, 30, 50 years later could be called upon at a time of, 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 of international institutional failure or chaos. Again, obviously they can be used in good times. Yes, of course. But can they be, are they available in bad times? Well, that would be the objective. And so it appeared to us at that time that because I was early into the high-tech world at that point, I could see the emergence of the internet coming. And I could see the evaporation of geography because of that. I couldn't foresee what is here today. That was more than I could foresee, but I, could, I had an inkling. And so that was, let's bring these things together. Let's bring the open formation time, psychological time that happens in the college 
framework and this college mindset. That, and let's bring that together with the internet. And let's bring that together on a global basis. And let's see if we can plant some seeds that might turn into something, whatever. <laughs> we didn't know what, but let's plant some seeds. And so that's my earliest memory, and that's still a very vivid memory. I can almost tell you uh, the exact road that we were driving on. So, Bill, what was it like to meet the partner universities for the first time? That's my next question. Okay. Here I need to give full credit uh, to um, Professor and Mrs. Semke. I didn't go around and individually select the schools at that point. Uh, I was very, very actively involved in my entrepreneurial life. I was uh, going between, uh, you know, making billions and going bankrupt on a daily basis. Uh, so, I mean, that's the way entrepreneurial life is. You know, you're up, you're down, you're <clears throat> you're going to conquer the world and then you're going to die. That, that's just an entrepreneur's life. So I was fully engaged in that. But <clears throat> I went back to the university that I graduated from, Lamar, uh, Westmar College in, in uh, Lamar's, Iowa. And there was Professor and Mrs. Semke, and I had always been impressed with them, both with their intellectual ability to, they were psychologists, they taught psychology, so they were interested in the human mind. I thought, okay, that's good. Uh, and they were also very kind, and they were curious about the world. And so I asked them to go around the world and select the schools. But we did have very, very deep discussions as to what would be the selection criteria. And the selection criteria were to find, and, and we had a finite budget, uh, so we, we couldn't do it on 100 countries. We could only choose five countries at that time. Now, fortunately, we have uh, the, the sixth added. But we were looking for countries where we thought were um, going to go through rapid, positive economic change. There was going to be growth there, positive growth. There wasn't going to be just total chaos. And that's why, of course, we chose East Germany. We knew that was going to go rapidly. We chose China. We knew that was going to go, go rapidly. We chose, of course, uh, uh, India. We knew that was going to go rapidly. And we chose Chile because of, as we looked around South America, uh, we said, which, you know, which place is going to be in the midst of chaos, uh, probably the most stable. And I think uh, we, have, we were fortunate because indeed that has turned out to be, to be true. Uh, Chile, with all the ups and downs and so on, has grown and has been stable. So it was an economic sort of growth we were looking for. And we were also looking uh, for a couple of other factors. One was, where is there a deep respect for education? Uh, if there's not a deep respect for education, then change is not necessarily, you know, is going to be difficult. So certainly all the countries that we selected have definitely that. And then we wanted to know also, where is there a strong work ethic? And I don't mean work like, you know, working in the fields. I mean, applying oneself to learn and to grow and to create something. And again, I think we, we did that fairly well. So we said to ourselves, just looking at it statistically, if you put all of these things together, the probabilities of something positive coming out is pretty close to 100%. Uh, so it wasn't a big risk at that point. It was just put the right things together. And then, of course, uh, the Semkis uh, got on the airplanes. Well, they, they did a lot of research first, and then they got on the airplanes. And they went around to those countries and told various universities in those various countries what we were thinking about. And, of course, some locations they were sort of laughed at and said who are you people and what what do you think and other people other places they were taken seriously and uh, in in all cases uh, the universities that uh, welcomed us in eventually they were willing to participate in in these crazy ideas or the call it a crazy ideas or the dream or the vision and um, that's I have to really hand uh, the sem Semkis a good taste and good selection and for having those conversations and the universities that didn't think that we were totally crazy. You know, I'm thinking about, so I, I'm, I'm coming from the Dilly University campus and I just, I'm listening to you and I'm like, I didn't know these things. I didn't know what the criteria was or, uh -huh. or anything like that. And they hit the nail right on the head <laughs> in so many respects. And I'm so glad that Dilly University and the administrators didn't think you all were outside of your minds. <laughs> they, they easily, they would have had good rational reason to think so. 
<laughs> right, right, exactly. Well, thank you so much. Um, so the next question that I have is uh, leaning into your entrepreneurial background and what three words would you choose to describe your career as an entrepreneur? Okay. Um, maybe accidental <laughs> was the first one. <laughs> I didn't start out to be an entrepreneur. Um, my education, uh, undergraduate education is in psychology and uh, my uh, graduate uh, degree is in Asian studies and Chinese language, Chinese philosophy. Um, so I have no preparation to be an entrepreneur whatsoever. I have no business courses. I've never taken a business course in my life. I have no accounting uh, or skills. I've never taken an accounting course. Uh, of course, I've been in uh, high tech all my life. I've never had a high tech course in my life. <laughs> so I, it's totally accidental and I am totally, completely, 100% uh, academically unprepared for my life. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm trying not to, to laugh on camera. <laughs> That is incredible. That is an incredible way to describe it. I think the the things that are important uh, for any entrepreneur skills and they're important for life skills. Um, and that is uh, the first thing is problem solving. Uh, as a kid, uh, I grew up poor. My father died when I was seven years old and we grew up on a farm. We had little or no money. Uh, we couldn't afford to um, go out and get the mechanic to uh, uh, fix the tractor if it broke. Uh, so I, I remember as a kid sitting there looking at the broken tractor and saying, no, if I were a tractor, where would I hurt? <laughs> I was trying to figure out, <laughs> you know, what, <laughs> what was it working? And it was that sort of uh, real life problem solving skills that uh, are, are useful at any place in life. And certainly for an entrepreneur, it's an entrepreneur, at least for an early stage entrepreneur, by definition, you're going to be doing something that there are no uh, existing answers for, uh, problems that have not been solved before. You're, the, the, you can't go to a book and say, how do I do this? Because if you go to a book and they have an answer, you know you're not entrepreneur here, you're, you're just repeating somebody else's experience. So a real entrepreneur that is breaking into totally new fields, he's doing stuff that hasn't been done for, has not been done before. So therefore, he he doesn't know. And so then it's a question, how do you form the problem? How do you solve the problem? And then as a corollary to that, there's no way that any one person can learn enough, fast enough, to solve all the problems that comes at them in an entrepreneurial situation. So that brings the second skill you have to have, and I don't know where I got it, but there, I have a certain amount of people skills. Um, not perfect, not by a long shot, but at least their average is somewhat above, slightly above average. And you have to be able to engage other people quickly in helping you solve the problems. You have to know how to listen. You have to know when not to listen. Uh, you have to know how to uh, encourage other people to join you in some crazy effort that you're on. So it's problem solving and people skills that I think are probably the, the, the two most most critical. And if you have those, and if you can learn fast, um, you probably can do all right. All right, so Bill, with such an extensive career history, when you look back at your career, do you have any regrets? You're talking professional careers or personal careers or what? Ooh, I I think it's asking about professional careers, but I'm leaving the floor open to your interpretation. Yeah, uh, professional careers. I um, I've made lots of mistakes, and are they regrets? Um, not necessarily. So. But the early part of my career life is when I went to Asia, and I'm deeply, deeply grateful that I did because that certainly shaped the rest of my life, um, personal and otherwise. But then when I came back and jumped headlong into the high tech business um, and survived against all kinds of odds, uh, most of them of my own stupidity and making because I didn't have any experience in any of those areas at all. Um, so I was very much learning on the job. But overall, entrepreneur wise, I think I did pretty well. Uh, obviously, 
individual mistakes along the way, but not not humongous. But then when I moved on from being an entrepreneur, where I was for certainly the first half of my career life, I moved on into being what is generally known as a venture capitalist or investing uh, in other people's com- companies. Because I had survived as an entrepreneur, I thought, well, entrepreneuring can't be that hard. I survived. I survived, and I knew I wasn't that uh, special. Uh, so maybe I should just invest and let other people do all the hard work, and I could uh, collect the benefits from all their hard work, and I could travel around the world and enjoy life while they did all the hard work of entrepreneuring. Well, it turns out I was a pretty lousy uh, venture capitalist. I made lots of mistakes in that area. Um, and some of them I will, and what were the mistakes? First of all, I can answer the mistakes as if I still accept venture capital as a good field, and then I will answer it as my critiques of the venture capital world. Um, if you're going to be a venture capitalist, you have to be fairly hard-hearted. Venture capital is a game of numbers, and you make investments, and you put more money behind those that are doing well, and those that are doing poorly, you cut and run, uh, to put it real crude. Uh, I, as a venture capitalist, didn't feel that way because I'd been an entrepreneur for so long. Um, I ended up um, feeling that um, I really understood the, the, the entrepreneur that I was investing in, and I felt sorry for him, and I had faith in him, and I kept throwing good money after bad. And one particular company that I was run by really a fine human being, but he kept making mistakes and I kept giving him more money and making mistakes and giving more money until over a period of probably eight or nine years, I managed to throw away completely every dime of $70 million on one particular investment. And that happened not in those numbers, but several times because I got too emotionally involved with the um with the, the, the entrepreneur and wasn't the cold-hearted venture capitalist as a banker kind of a guy you should be. So I have determined that I'm a pretty good venture, I'm a pretty good entrepreneur. I'm a lousy venture capitalist. Okay, so let me make some critiques then about the venture capital world and the whole sort of Western capitalist world. The Western capitalist world is about, the, according to the language that I use now, pretty extracting. And it sort of sucks money or sucks value from lower down the pyramid. If you can get up on the pyramid and you can get a pile of capital and use that to suck more value out from, from beneath. And I find that at this stage in my life, um, neither good. In fact, I find it offensive. Um, and I think that the, we need to find uh, an alternate way uh, to organize economics. So I spend most of my life now looking at new ways to look at economics to make it what I call regenerative and not extractive. And so the fact that I failed as a venture capitalist, um, I think I, I now have turned into um, something that I'm sort of glad happened to me. If I would have been horribly successful as a venture capitalist, I probably would have just continued doing that and would continue being out there, being an, what I call in my current language, an extractor. Uh, now, I'm not speaking against the individual people, as I'm speaking against the system here, not, not individual people. They're good venture capitalists as human beings. But many of us, uh, in whatever culture we're caught up in, we're caught up in doing things that are not good for human beings overall. And the current capitalist system, I believe, in many ways is doing things that are not good uh, for human beings and other systems I also have critiques with. So this isn't, you know, <laughs> I have crit- 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 critiques for many systems. But as we try to create a new economics that will be kind to humans and to the planet, uh, we have to have a new way. And if I hadn't somewhat failed as a venture capitalist, I would not perhaps have migrated to where I'm at now and hopefully being a part of new ideas that will hopefully be kinder to humans and to the planet. That is, that is a lot to process and such good things to think about. Um, do you believe that if you had continued in, well, if you had been successful in venture capitalism and the systems therein and those n- not so great things, um, 
do you think it would have affected how you felt about creating the the Melton Foundation? I'm not sure of the timing. The um, Melton Foundation I put together while I was still very much in my entrepreneurial life. I was still on the upswing there. And thankfully, I did it back then because if I would have waited until at the end of my uh, venture capital life, I would not have had the resources uh, to do it. So it, it worked out. Timing worked out well. Okay. Um, but a lot of what I was doing at the time of my entrepreneurial life before I did the whole venture capital thing was um, not very well examined. You know, the, the old saying that uh, an unexamined life is not a life not worth living. I think life's experiences uh, hands us uh, the the challenges that cause us to examine what we're doing. And certainly, if failing at being a super duper venture capitalist um, allowed me to examine uh, that part of my life and whether that part of the life needed to be looked at with a new set of lenses. Well, thank you for that. And as we're we're thinking about your career. Uh, my last question in that regard is when you look back on your career, what are you most proud of? Well, early um, early in the days um, when the Semkis were still helping me form the foundation and they were saying, well, what shall we call this thing? Um, I said, I don't care. We can call it educational foundation, whatever you want to call it. And they say, we think we should call it the Mountain Foundation. I said, no, 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 that, that's too, you know, that's self-aggrandizing and I don't want any part of that. But I have to say, now as an 80 year old, as I look back, um, the, the foundation probably is the thing that I am the most proud of. Um, you know, all the, the business things, yeah, those are good stories and ups and downs and so on. But uh, I think in terms of impact, uh, in terms of a constructive thing, I think the foundation definitely is um, the thing that is, is, I can look back and say, okay, that was good. Well, thank you. And for us as fellows, we're, we're, we're happy and very thankful that you did it as well. And, and to be the thing you're most proud of, it just feels so good. Um, so then uh, my next question, which is related to this one, uh, what makes you most proud when thinking of the foundation? The potential uh, for it. Um, clearly, as I look at the many, many of the lives of the people that I've seen come through the foundation and grow and flower and go on to their individual lives and so on, I'm, I'm hugely, um, hugely proud to be associated with them. Um, I know that the selection process of getting into the foundation is difficult. Uh, I know that uh, if there would have been a foundation that I applied for it, I would not have been accepted. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and just to see the things that uh, they have done in, in their own lives, that makes me huge, hugely proud. But I think as even more so, as I look toward the future, you know, the, the foundation, I don't believe has really been fully tested yet. Uh, that is, I see, and we can't help but see, as we look at the news on a daily basis, the potential institutional, cultural, national chaos that, that's coming. Um, you know, I, we all hope that, that things will work out smoothly, but on the other hand, humans being humans, um, the prognosis is, is, is scary at best. And it is precisely um, for these kinds of times and for the problem solving capability of a group of whatever we are now, four, five, six hundred people uh, that have had a vision of a way of working together. Uh, how can those minds, those spirits, those energies, those understandings, how can those be used? Uh, constructively, creatively, um, over the next, whatever it is, five, 10, 15, 20, or 100 years. Uh, that, um, I, I think, is, is the test. And, you know, will, will it pass the test? I don't know. Uh, no life form is ever guaranteed, you know. Do you, I think, to a large extent, we as, as humans and we as cultures are expressions of, of some form of mind. And 
uh, mind comes packaged in some sort of a life form, whether it's a plant or a human or a little puppy or a, a giant of some kind. It's these life forms, and these life forms either learn how to work together, or they learn how to deselect themselves from the the evolutionary process. And uh, hopefully, the foundation is a life form that is constructive, is is growing, and uh, will be part of part of the answer and not part of the problem. And I believe that it has the capability of, of being just that. Thank you, Bill, and I agree. And I'd like to say that working for the foundation now and seeing the newest generation of fellows, like they're incredible, and they have a lot mm -hmm. of ideas and a lot of passion and a lot of desire to be the change that they want to see not only in their local communities but in their lives and mm -hmm. it's a very empowering space to be in to continually see these generation after generation of these these incredible young people mm -hmm. who then become incredible adults and and hold on to this Melton Foundation Melton Fellowship experience with them I mean even to the point where I know that being a Melton Fellow comes with its own idea, its own badge, its own seal of open communication, mutual respect, trust, and it's built lifetimes of, of relationships. So without further ado, I will be bringing our interview to a close, but I just want to thank you so, so much for taking the time out today to answer these questions and for us to be able to share in the celebration that is your 80th year in this uh, meat suit. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> so thank you so, so much. And uh well, everyone, you'll hear this on our podcast and we'll be sharing it with the Melton community and we will see you all soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Best to all of you.